All right, let's get started. So once again, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you all have uh, are stocked up on food and snow boots and all that stuff for the weekend. Um, today, we're going to be continuing with the uh, lecture that I began on patches on Tuesday. And I will share my screen here. All right, so if you recall, on Tuesday, we had begun talking about the um, genesis of patches, where they come from. And we had talked about several types. We were up to remnant patches, um, which are, I'm sorry, by the way, let me just make sure, just wanna make sure this is recording before I go too far. And it is good, okay. Um, so anyway, we were talking about the um, where patches come from, and we we're up to remnant patches, which are patches that are left behind as a result of human development. Let's see if I can get this to advance. There we go. We and we talked about how that results in uh, habitat fragmentation, and talked about the definition of fragmentation. Looked at this little. Um, time lapse of development in a forested area and how that um, how that sort of gradually over time eats away at um, the amount of available habitat and also the connectivity of that habitat. And we talked about forest fragmentation worldwide and how that's a big issue. We looked at some time lapses from the Amazon uh, rainforest and the massive amount of development that's happening in the Amazon rainforest. And we were up to um, this, which is a short video that um, talks about some of the impacts of fragmentation. We've, we've already talked about how fragmentation has a negative impact on wildlife populations, but it also has a negative impact on human populations, specifically uh, looking at human health. So we're going to look at this next. So this is from the American Museum of Natural History. We live in an age of emerging infectious disease. We humans are getting attacked by an increasing number of brand new infectious diseases. Where's the next disease likely to break out? Why? What are we doing for the environment that might make a disease more likely to emerge? To answer those questions, you need to understand what are the complex interactions between species in nature that give rise to these emergence events. Lyme disease was discovered when um, a very unusual cluster of cases of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis occurred in and around Lyme, Connecticut. And it took some serious detective work to figure out that this arthritis was a late stage symptom of a disease caused by a bacterium that's transmitted to people by tick bites. And since the late 70s and early 80s, Lyme disease has grown dramatically, both in number of cases and in the spatial extent of the disease itself. And right now, throughout the North Temperate Zone, Lyme disease is the most commonly reported vector-borne disease. Vectors are insects or ticks that transmit pathogens from one host to another. The ticks that transmit Lyme disease to people hatch free of infection 
They only take one blood. Then they molt into the nymphal stage. If that host that they fed on was infected, they can acquire the Lyme bacteria and they can then transmit Lyme disease. But all hosts are certainly not equal in terms of disease risks that affect humans. We're interested in how the diversity of the host population affects the likelihood that ticks are going to be infected with Lyme. So that translates into risk to humans. This is an animal that Kira caught three or four days ago, and it's been sitting in the rear facility eating wonderful food <laughs> and dropping ticks. This had, I think, quite a few ticks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots of ticks. We can lift it. So we need to know how likely each species is to feed ticks, how many ticks it feeds, how likely it is to infect the ticks that it feeds. And then we can sort of deconstruct the host community and see what would equal high risk to people and what would equal low risk to people. So we've tried to capture everything with fur and feathers, essentially. We got something in this one. Um, most days we get up in the morning and we go out and we check traps that have been set the night before. So this is a female bacteria? Then any animals that we caught are processed. Some of them are very good at transmitting the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And some are what we would consider dilution hosts. Yep, little mouse. Animals that may feed a lot of ticks, but don't transmit the bacteria. Nice. Possums tend to feed a lot of ticks. So they'll get a lot of ticks on them. Not many of those ticks will actually make it off. So a lot of them die somewhere in that process. Um, and then of those that actually make it through to the next stage, most of them aren't infected, so they tend to be pretty good uh, dilution hosts. So a lot of possums in the environment is actually pretty good for lowering our risk of Lyme disease. So we like these little guys. <laughs> He's gonna play dead. Yeah. <laughs> Bye guys. We determine which host is the best for spreading Lyme disease by bringing them back to the lab. We hold them for about three days. During those three days, any larvae that are naturally infesting the animal will feed and drop off. So we collect the ticks in here after they drop off. So this is our data. We search the pan and collect the ticks that have engorged, which gives us a couple of pieces of information. We can figure out how many ticks are feeding on that animal at any given moment. And we can eventually test the tick to determine the percentage of ticks that end up being infected. Right now I'm taking ticks to crush. Mm -hmm. And that's how we get the gut material out of the tick and then isolate the DNA. Then we run it through a real time PCR or polymerase chain reaction, which is a way of splitting the DNA and detecting Lyme disease. What we found is that the probability that a tick is going to acquire an infection when it feeds on a white footed mouse is about 90%. Contrast that with the probability that it's going to get infected if it feeds off an opossum or a skunk or a raccoon, which they readily bite, and that's down below 10%. As we fragment the landscape, we chop up continuous forest into little bits, we lose species, they disappear. One of the last creatures is the white-footed mouse. So as we reduce diversity, we're losing the species that protect us and favoring the ones that make us sick. There's no such thing as a natural system anymore, a truly natural system. As you start reducing forest sizes, you start making habitats that the really resilient species can tolerate and some of the other species can't. So what we're studying obviously isn't natural systems. It's 
human impact of natural systems. And what we're becoming more aware of is that human impacts can bite us back. All right, so that's one example of how our patterns of land use and fragmentation of habitat can have um, impacts on human health. Um, and, but there are other ways too. I don't know if any of you have watched any uh, documentaries or uh, news shows about um, the current pandemic and some of the ways in which uh, human land use uh, impacted that as well. Does, has anyone seen anything about that or have any hypotheses about why our land use patterns and habitat fragmentation makes pandemics like this more likely? Who, who knows what the uh, origin of the pandemic is? the suspected origin of it, at least. <laughs> a bat. So I heard someone say bat. Well, it was a pangolin. Or a pangolin, yeah. So they're not quite sure whether it was a bat or a pangolin. The pangolin theory is that a bat infected a pangolin, um, and then that infected a human in turn. So, but it was a wild, it was basically a wild animal, right? And um, even though it was, um, the source was um, probably the wet market in uh, Wuhan in China, um, there are uh, reasons why our land use patterns make this kind of disease spread more frequent. Does anyone know why that might be? Just knowing that it was a, a, you know, a pathogen that jumped from a wild species to a human. Well, I was kind of looking at this one documentary that explained how people who are working in places that are like doing clear cutting and mm -hmm. cutting forests end up eating wild animals because that's the only thing available. Mm -hmm. So people who are working in remote parts of the world in forests and stuff end up eating stuff like bats. So that's some of what happens. Definitely. And I, I would say the, the bigger lesson out of that is the fact that the more that we fragment habitat and the more that human uh, settlements and development patterns expand into areas that were previously uh, more or less wild, the more humans have contact with animal populations that they previously did not typically have contact with. And the more that you have uh, these contacts, the more likely it is that pathogen can jump from wild populations to humans. And so that's why uh, there's so much concern over uh, land use patterns and how that's um, impacting the likelihood of future pandemics. So that's uh, fragmentation. And then finally, the, uh, or sorry, that's um, uh, remnant patches. And then finally, the last type of patch is another one that's impacted by humans. Uh, sorry, did someone say something? OK. Um, the last one is also impacted by humans, but in this case, it's a, ben it's a uh, beneficial impact. And this is in the case where people create what are known as resource protection patches. So this is where um, either an existing um, patch is, uh, is basically <clears throat> expanded or a new patch is introduced to help uh, benefit wildlife populations as well as human health and try to restore some of those resources that have been eaten up through the process of development. So, uh, this is an example of a park uh, designed by Turinscape in China, where they're basically restoring this uh, degraded wetland area back into a functioning wetland and making a park out of it. And you, you can see it's a pretty massive uh, area that's been restored there. And again, the idea here is trying to um, repair some of the damage that's been done to existing habitats. <clears throat> 
And so this is one of the benefits that humans can have when they try to do the right thing with, um, with the resources and with the habitats that exist. Um, but again, we're, you know, <laughs> this is just going back in and repairing stuff that we've already damaged. So in some ways, it's um, a bit of a losing battle. At least there's awareness now and there are attempts being made at projects like this. But uh, the amount of fragment, the, the rate of fragmentation is far outstripping uh, the rate of uh, resource uh, protection patches being created. So um, this is another uh, short video that we're going to watch. This one has to do with the human influence on disturbance patches. So this talks about ways in which, so we think about disturbance patches as being something that, um, well, actually let's, let's ask uh, you guys first. Does anyone remember what is a disturbance patch? We talked about in the last class. Or like a fire or a flood or something like that. Exactly. So it's some kind of a natural event that that creates a patch in the landscape um, as a result of that uh, disturbance event. So we think of those as being um, more or less natural occurrences that we don't necessarily have a lot of control over. Um, but in fact, the ways in which humans interact with the environment has a big influence on uh, certain types of disturbance patches. And so this um, next video is going to talk about how, how we've impacted those and how we've actually, the ways in which we use the landscape and the ways in which we manage the landscape actually make those uh, disturbances more frequent and more severe when they do happen. Whoops. There we go. As you probably noticed, in recent years, a lot of Western forests have burned in large and destructive wildfires. If you're like me, this Western landscape is actually why my family and I live here. And as a scientist and a father, I've become deeply concerned about what we're leaving behind for our kids and now my five grandkids. In the US, an area that's larger than the state of Oregon has burned in just the last 10 years. And tens of thousands of homes have been destroyed. Acres burned and homes destroyed have steadily increased over the last three decades. And individual fires that are bigger than 100,000 acres, they're actually on the rise. These are what we call megafires. Megafires are the result of the way we've managed this Western landscape over the last 150 years in a steadily warming climate. Much of the destruction that we are currently seeing could actually have been avoided. I spent my entire career studying these Western landscapes and the science is pretty clear. If we don't change a few of our fire management habits, we're gonna lose many more of our beloved forests. Some won't recover in our lifetime or my kid's lifetime. It's time we confront some tough truths about wildfires and come to understand that we need to learn to better live with them and change how they come to our forests, our homes, and our communities. So why is this happening? Well, that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. You see this forest? Isn't it beautiful? Well, the forests that we see today look nothing like the forests of 100 or 150 years ago. Thankfully, panoramic photos were taken in the 1930s from thousands of Western mountaintop lookouts and they show a fair approximation of the forest that we inherited 
The best word to describe these forests of old is patchy. The historical forest landscape was this constantly evolving patchwork of open and closed canopy forests of all ages. And there was so much evidence of fire. And most fires were pretty small by today's standards. And it's important to understand that this landscape was open with meadows and open canopy forests. And it was the grasses of the meadows and in the grassy understories of the open forests that many of the wildfires were carried. There were other forces at work too, shaping this historical patchwork. For example, topography, whether a place faces north or south, or it's on a ridge top or in a valley bottom. Elevation, how far up the mountain it is, and weather, whether a place gets a lot of snow and rain, sunlight and warmth. These things all worked together to shape the way the forest grew. And the way the forest grew shaped the way fire behaved on the landscape. There was crosstalk between the patterns and the processes. You can see that in dry forests, trees were open grown and fairly far apart. Fires were frequent here, and when they occurred, they weren't that severe. While further up the mountain, in the moist and the cold forests, trees were more densely grown and fires were less frequent, but when they occurred, they were quite a bit more severe. These different forest types, the environments they grew in, and fire severity, they all worked together to shape this historical patchwork. And there was so much power in this patchwork. It provided a natural mechanism to resist the spread of future fires across the landscape. Once a patch of forest burned, it helped prevent the flow of fire across the landscape. A way to think about it is that the burned patches help the rest of the forest to be forest. Let's add humans to the mix. For 10,000 years, Native Americans lived on this land. Oops, sorry about that. Landscape, and they intentionally burned it a lot. <clears throat> They used fire to burn meadows and to thin certain forests so they could grow more food. They used fire to increase graze for the deer and the elk and the bison that they hunted. And most importantly, they figured out if they burned in the spring and the fall, they could avoid the out of control fires of summer. European settlement, it occurred much later in the mid 1800s. And by the 1880s, livestock grazing was in high gear. And if you think about it, the cattle and the sheep, they ate the grasses, which had been the conveyor belt for the historical fires. And this prevented once frequent fires from thinning out trees and burning up dead wood. Later came roads and railroads, and they acted as potent fire breaks, interrupting further the flow of fire across this landscape. And then something happened which caused a sudden pivot in our society. In 1910, we had a huge wildfire. It was the size of the state of Connecticut. We called it the Big Burn. It stretched from eastern Washington to western Montana, and it burned in a few days. Three million acres devoured several towns, and it killed 87 people. Most of them were firefighters. Because of the big burn, wildfire became public enemy number one. And this would shape the way that we would think about wildfire in our society for the next 100 years. Thereafter, the Forest Service, just five years young at the time, was tasked with the responsibility of putting out all wildfires on 193 million acres of public lands. And they took this responsibility very seriously. They developed this unequaled ability to put fires out, and they put out 95 to 98% of all fires every single year in the US. And from this point on, it was now fire suppression and not wildfires that would become a prime shaper of our forests. After World War II, timber harvesting got going in the West, and the logging removed the large and the old trees. And these were survivors of centuries of wildfires 
and the forest filled in, thin barked, fire sensitive, small trees filled in the gaps. And our forest became dense with trees so layered and close together that they were touching each other. So fires were unintentionally blocked by roads and railroads, but cattle and sheep ate the grass. Then along comes fire suppression and logging, removing the big trees. And you know what happened? All these factors work together to allow the forest to fill in, creating what I call the current epidemic of trees. Go figure. More trees than the landscape can support. So when you compare what forests looked like 100 years ago and today, the change is actually remarkable. Notice how the patchwork has filled in. Dry south slopes are now covered with trees. A patchwork that was once sculpted by mostly small and sort of medium-sized fires has filled in. Do you see the blanket of trees? After just 150 years, we have a dense carpet of forest, but there's more. Because trees are growing so close together and because tree species, tree sizes and ages are so similar across large areas, fires not only move easily from acre to acre, but now so do diseases and insect outbreaks, which are killing or reducing the vitality of really large sections of forest now. And after a century without fire, dead branches and downed trees on the forest floor, they're at powder keg levels. What's more, our summers are getting hotter and they're getting drier and they're getting windier. And the fire season is now 40 to 80 days longer each year. Because of this, climatologists are predicting that the area burned since 2000 will double or triple in the next three decades. And we're building houses in the middle of this. Two recently published studies tell us that more than 60% of all new housing starts are being built in this flammable and dangerous mess. So when we do get a fire, large areas can literally go up in smoke. How do you feel now about the forest image that I first showed you? It scares the heck out of me. So what do we do? We need to restore the power of the patchwork. We need to put the right kind of fire back into the system again. It's how we can resize the severity of many of our future fires. And the silver lining is that we have tools and we have know-how to do this. Let's look at this, some of the tools. We can use prescribed burning to intentionally thin out trees and burn up dead fuels. We do this to systematically reduce them and keep them reduced. And what is that going to do? It's going to create already burned patches on the landscape that will resist the flow of future fires. We can combine mechanical thinning with some of these treatments where it's appropriate to do so and capture some commercial value and perhaps underwrite some of these treatments, especially around urban areas. And the best news of all is the prescribed burning produces so much less smoke than wildfires do. It's not even close, but there's a hitch. Prescribed burning smoke is currently regulated under air quality rules as an avoidable nuisance. But wildfire smoke, it simply gets a pass. Makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> so you know what happens? We do far too little prescribed burning and we continually eat smoke in the summers from megafires. We all need to work together to get this changed. And finally, there's managed wildfires. Instead of putting all the fires out, we need to put some of them back to work, thinning forests and reducing dead fuels. We can herd them around the landscape when it's appropriate to do so to help restore the power of the patchwork. And as you've probably figured out by now, this is actually a social problem. It's got ecological and climate explanations. 
it's a social problem. And it'll take us humans to solve it. Public support for these tools is poor. Prescribed burning and managed wildfires are not well supported. We actually all simply want fires to magically go away and take that pesky smoke with them, don't we? But there is no future without lots of fire and lots of smoke. That option is actually not on the table. Until we, the owners of public lands, make it our high priority to do something about the current situation, we're going to experience continued losses to megafires. So it's up to us. We can spread this message to our lawmakers, folks who can help us manage our fires and our forests. If we're unsuccessful, where will you go to play when your favorite places are burned black? Where will you go to breathe deep and slow? Thank you. Oops. There we go. So pretty paradoxical, right? Because that's an example where we usually think of humans as creating the um, remnant patches and as being the agents that are creating the fragmentation. But in this case, with the wildfires, you have a landscape that evolved to be fragmented. And through our fire management practices, we've created a much less fragmented landscape, which leads to much bigger and more intense fires. And so it's kind of a paradoxical um, relationship that we have with the landscape in that case, but um, just as destructive when we think about uh, the impacts it has, um, particularly, uh, you know, well, for, for wildlife, but also for obviously human habitation and as humans encroach further and further into these burnable areas. All right, so next we're going to talk about um, some of the characteristics of patches and how we measure and understand them. <clears throat> so patches are analyzed and differentiated in terms of four different characteristics. Those are size, shape, number, and distribution. And patches may be, uh, they vary obviously. So patches can be as large as a national forest <clears throat> or as small as a single tree. Um, patches can be numerous in the landscape, such as um, when we have patches that are uh, created by um, various types of, let's say, um, disease or insect outbreaks where, where it turns the landscape into a large number of isolated patches, um, or they can be few in number like an oasis in a desert. And the location of the patches can be beneficial or deleterious to the optional function of the landscape and the health of the wildlife populations therein, depending on their relationship to each other. So first we'll start by taking a closer look at patch size. And one of the things that we've been talking about, particularly with relationship to wildlife, is that large patches have benefits over smaller patches, right? So larger patches of vegetation, um, they have a couple of different benefits. One is that they protect aquifers and stream networks. So they're protecting water resources in the landscape. Um, they sustain viable populations of most interior species and they provide core habitat and escape cover for large home range vertebrates, um, meaning vertebrates that range over a large area. Uh, and they also permit near natural disturbance regimes, meaning that they tend to reduce the uh, severity of disturbance regimes because of uh, their size and um, and the characteristics that they have in terms of the difference between uh, the exterior landscape, the edge, and then the interior. So when we talk about 
interior populations of wildlife. We're talking about the wildlife that uh, live, that uh, do best in an area that uh, does not experience edge influences. So edge influences, we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, but that's basically um, the portion of the patch where the exterior forces have the most impact and where the landscape uh, of that patch is not protected uh, from those influences as much as they are on the interior of the patch. As we look at the size of patches, the local extinction probability um, tends to increase for smaller patches uh, because you don't have the um, sort of the, uh, the pool of uh, genetic resources that you need to be sustainable and to be robust and resilient to changes that might happen in that patch. So the smaller the patch size, the more likely it is that a species will go locally extinct. In larger patches, uh, because it supports a larger population, just by the sheer size of that population, as the population size fluctuates over time, you're less likely to have an extinction, a localized extinction event in that patch. Right, so again, here's um, an example of that where you have either patch size or higher quality um, patches that are going to have better stability in terms of wildlife population as opposed to uh, smaller or lower quality patches. You're also going to have more habitat diversity in a larger patch, right? And that just kind of makes, uh, makes sense in terms of logic and that the larger the area, the more different types of microclimates or smaller sort of what you might consider sub patches within that larger patch are going to exist. And as we've learned earlier, the more diversity that you have within that patch, the more resilient that landscape is going to be and the more biodiversity you'll have, which leads to a more stable uh, environment and more stable ecosystem. Right, and so this is an example looking at um, habitat patches, right? So the green areas here, the dark green areas are those um, areas that are preserved in the landscape. And obviously if we're looking at a map like this, um, you're going to expect this one very large patch at the center to have much more biodiversity, to be much more resilient and to be uh, much less likely to experience localized extinction events as opposed to some of these smaller patches that we see um, around the edges. This diagram is showing how um, patches, um, specifically patches that have been subdivided, um, can sometimes help spread uh, or rather help uh, prevent the spread of some types of disturbances, right? So they talked in, um, in the Paul Hesburgh video, we saw him talk about how the introduction of roadways into the forested areas uh, subdivide those forests and help uh, prevent the spread of fire, which in this case was um, had a deleterious effect on the landscape because it led to areas that would build up more and more fuel and lead to more intense fires. Right, so in this example, we have some burned areas from previous fires that are creating a patchwork across the landscape. And those burned areas are actually, um, in, in this case, they're helping to prevent the spread of uh, pine bark beetle because the pine bark beetles can't travel as far as they're on one side of a burned area. It's harder for them to travel to the other side of that burned area and infect more trees. And so this, this patchwork of these burn areas that we see can actually help to prevent uh, some of those larger problems that we have with the uh, park, uh, pine bark beetle, which in turn lead to more intense and devastating fires when the bark beetles kill more trees. 
So having some of these natural breaks that occur in the landscape as a result of the fire um, has a beneficial impact long term of uh, protecting many of the trees from insect and disease. Um, in general, though, when we're talking about patches, particularly about remnant patches, uh, bigger is almost always better, uh, particularly for the wildlife that, um, that they protect. More interior habitat equals higher bi biodiversity and more resilient ecosystems, right? So again, we're going to have, if we're comparing a patch like this or a patch like this to some of the smaller patches or to these more scattered plantings of trees that we see in the background, you're going to have a more resilient population uh, in these larger patches. Next, we'll look at patch shape and the impact that has on habitat quality. So if we look at two different examples of a patch with the same area, um, but with two different shapes, we can begin to look at what kind of impact that's going to have um, on the biodiversity and on the quality of that habitat. So a circle has the lowest possible ratio of edge to area, right? So if you're comparing the um, border of that patch to the overall area of it, then you're going to, that's the smallest possible ratio that you can have. A more con the more convoluted the shape is, the higher the ratio goes, right? So both of these patches are the same area of 100 uh, square meters. But in this case, we have an edge for the circle that's only 35 meters. The edge on this size is double that at 70 meters, right? So what does that mean for habitat quality? Well, it's got a couple of different um, impacts because edges have different characteristics than habit than the uh, patch interior do. So one of the first impacts it has is in terms of the distribution and the numbers of edge versus interior species. So the more convoluted the patches, the higher the proportion of edge habitat, which means that you're going to increase the number of edge species. Um, but also decrease the number of interior species. And it's, it doesn't have the same um, impact on both types of species. So it only has a slight impact in terms of uh, raising the number of edge species, but it has a huge impact in terms of reducing the number of interior species, right? And so here we have an example of a circle that has, and we're seeing the proportion of edge species here versus the interior species. And then here's a more convoluted patch. And you can see you have a much smaller area. Again, same, you know, similar area, overall area. Um, but because this has a more convoluted patch, you have much more area that is um, habitable for edge species as opposed to the interior species. Right? And this is partially a result of the differences between having a straight versus curvilinear boundary. So straight boundaries have more species uh, movement along them. So typically they act as a barrier to movement across the landscape because species will come up against this um, sort of very sudden and harsh edge in the landscape and they'll tend to move along it as opposed to through it. Uh, whereas when you have a more convoluted boundary, it's more likely to have movement across the boundary. And part of the reason for that is that those convoluted boundaries tend to have a more gradual change in the composition of the plants at that edge, where it goes from maybe grasses to shrubs to larger shrubs to small trees to large trees, as opposed to just having this very harsh um, boundary of having you know, let's say grasses right next to mature trees. Right, and of course, this is something that we see reflected in the landscape in terms of the types of boundaries that we find between um, the uh, natural occurring, naturally occurring types of landscapes and the human impacted landscapes. So of course, in naturally occurring landscapes, we tend to have more curvilinear, 
uh, types of boundaries, whereas in the human impacted landscapes, we have more straight boundaries. And that's just a result of the way that humans divide up land and uh, buy and sell land and, um, and build communities and agriculture and so forth. And by, by the way, all of these diagrams are from uh, the Landscape Ecology for Landscape Architecture and Planning book that's listed in the syllabus. Um, it's a great resource in terms of trying to getting a handle on understanding um, some of these different types of concepts with, with regards to landscape ecology and what their um, manifestations are within uh, planning and landscape architecture disciplines. Right, so if we look at three of uh, these sort of different ways of looking at um, how patches occur in the landscape, so patch size, patch connectivity in terms of their relationship to each other, and also patch shape, uh, species diversity will increase, obviously, as you go from smaller to larger patches, we've already talked about that, how the number, how the species diversity increases. Also patch connectivity increases the species diversity. And that's partly because of uh, this idea of ideal habitat versus effective habitat, which is what we looked at when we were doing the, uh, the GIS project with the chipmunks, right? So um, as you have better connectivity in terms of those patches being closer together, so that it's easier for species to jump from patch to patch, you're going to have greater species diversity within those patches um, and also more robust populations of individual species. And then patch shape is going to have an impact, right? Because as you, if you have a long and skinny patch, it's basically you have a much larger area that's um, going to be impacted by the influences of outside forces and you're going to have less of that interior and the rounder that those patches get, the more interior habitat you're going to have and the more uh, resilient you're going to have uh, for populations and also for greater species diversity. And so that brings us um, to this idea of sort of the edges of these patches, right? Because the edges become really important when we're talking about patches uh, because they have such an impact on both the species that like to inhabit those edge areas versus the species that inhabit the interiors. And so the next uh, term we're going to look at is ecotone. And an ecotone is a region of transition between two ecological communities um, or it can also be described as the edge of a patch where the interior habitat transitions to the habitat of the matrix, right? So these are areas where you have changing plant communities, changing amounts of influence from uh, exterior forces and therefore different types of species that are adapted to those types of environments. Right, so here's a diagram that shows a forest patch it shows the edge of the forest patch where sort of the trees give way to different types of vegetation. And then the ecotone is really the area that extends from an area sort of outside the edge to an area inside the edge where you're having uh, the reflection of these influences from outside plant species and animal species and natural forces that are having uh, a greater impact than they do on the interior. Right, so we have the edge and then extending from an area inside that edge to an area outside that edge is really the width of that ecotone where you have that transition happening from the matrix to the patch interior. And, um, and then where, where the ecotone buffers end up being is going to be different for different patches and different matrices depending on um, what the influences are that we're talking about. Right? And when we're looking at the shape of that ecotone or boundary, um, we find that uh, it creates coves and lobes, right? So coves are areas that are sort of carved out of the patch and then lobes are areas that stick out into the matrix. And the presence of those coves and lobes, lobes 
uh, along an edge provides greater habitat diversity than along a straight edge and encourages higher overall species diversity, right? And again, this is the type of edge that you tend to find in a more natural environment where you have different forces acting on each other as opposed to human management that's creating those straight edges um, where you're going to have less diversity. Does anyone want to take a guess at why this kind of curvilinear type of edge with its coves and lobes has more species diversity than a straight edge? Uh, inside those lobes, there's going to be like a different type of habitat because it's close to the edge, but not fully interior. Exactly. So, so essentially what happens is that the more curvilinear the edge, the wider the ecotone is because you have a, a greater area of that transitional space that's going from whatever the matrix is to the interior of the patch. And um, just logically thinking about it, the, the wider that ecotone, the greater the diversity of ecosystems that you'll have within that transition zone. And so the greater the species diversity will be. Right, and then as we talked about um, with one of the earlier diagrams, the interaction with the surroundings is going to change. So the more convoluted the shape of the patch, the more interaction there is, uh, whether that's positive or negative, um, between the patch and the surrounding matrix. Because as we talked about, um, you have more movement of species across the landscape when you have these gradual transitions, as you do when there's a harsh edge and species tend to move along that edge rather than across it. And so you're going to have more interaction uh, with the surroundings when you have a convoluted patch. And so this is an example of what you might consider an ecologically optimum patch shape, right? So the ecologically optimum patch provides a couple of different ecological benefits and they, they describe it as being spaceship shaped, but essentially you have a rounded core that helps protect the resources of the interior, right? So um, that, as we saw that rounded core area um, is going to have the lowest proportion of edge to interior. So you're going to have the greatest amount of interior habitat for those interior species. Um, but in this case, it's not just simply a circle, right? We also have um, a couple of fingers that go out into the landscape that do create more habitat for some of those edge species and also creates opportunity for species diversal to be able to travel to other nearby patches. And so this is something that's really considered to be uh, sort of that optimum shape where again, that, that core is more or less rounded so that you're maximizing the amount of interior, but then you also have some fingers coming off of it that create that edge and ecotone habitat where you have a more gradual transition uh, and you're going to have a more and better species dispersal to other patches. Shape and orientation are also going to have an impact on the dispersal of species. So a shape uh, or rather a patch that's oriented with its long axis parallel to the root of dispersing individuals has a lower probably probability of being recolonized than a patch that's perpendicular, right? And again, that's just as a result of, um, you know, if you think about it as a result of probability, right? As you have species that kind of venture out to look for the next patch, the more of the edge of the next patch that's going to, that's parallel to the patch they're coming from, the more likely they are to run into it and recolonize that patch. Whereas if it's um, if it's oriented perpendicular to the edge of the patch that those species are coming from, more of those species are likely to kind of bypass that patch. Next, we'll talk about patch number and the impact that that has on populations, right? So there are some uh, benefits to small patches. So small patches that interrupt extensive stretches of matrix can act as stepping stones for species movements. So they are not in and of themselves necessarily creating a continuous corridor, 
of uh, habitat for species to move through, but they do act as um, places, they're sort of like waypoints that species can stop over in as they're traveling from one large patch to another large patch, right? And again, we saw some of this effect in the idea of that effective habitat idea that we looked at with the chipmunks in City Park, where they'll move small, small distances between patches. And so if you have lots of small patches close to each other, the effective habitat area increases because you're able to move those species more efficiently uh, from patch to patch. Um, some of these smaller patches also contain some uncommon species um, where large patches are absent or sometimes um, are unsuitable for a specific species and so allows other species to move into those smaller patches. Um, they also provide different and supplemental ecological benefits as compared to large patches. And again, that's a result of um, these, you know, if you're looking at the overall ecotone area, so that's that transitional edge area around the patch, you're going to have more of it with these smaller patches than you do with one large patch. And so that's going to create more diverse types of habitats and therefore some uh, different types of species mix than you'll get in a larger patch. And when we're looking at clusters of patches, um, removal of a patch will obviously cause habitat loss, which can reduce the population size of the species that's dependent on that habitat type. And it can also reduce the habitat diversity, which leads to uh, fewer species. Right. So in this case, we see like one patch going away, which might seem like not such a big deal in this overall cluster of patches. But depending on which species live in that particular patch, it can lead to um, an entire species disappearing from that cluster. So it depends on um, where those species are living within that cluster. And um, that will have different impacts on the overall species mix for that cluster of patches. So here's a different aspect of number and size of patches and their impact on forest habitat. So this is one pattern of timber harvesting that's known as patch cutting, right? So um, sometimes they'll go in to harvest timber and they'll just do it in these small patches and leave the sort of larger, in this case, the, the harvested areas become the patches and then the forested area is the matrix. Here's another pattern, which is known as clear cutting, where you just take one large area and you cut out all the trees uh, from that area. So when we look at those two different options, which one do you think is more uh, destructive to forest habitat? And why? Anyone want to take a, a stab at it? I'd say clear cutting because they're uh, continuous areas that have been destroyed. So it's kind of harder for animals to move around them. Yep. So that's that's going to be part of it. Yeah, What's another active clear straight edges? Yeah, there's you basically have uh, you have more straight edges, right? And you have therefore um, sort of a longer continuous area of this difficult to traverse type of um, boundary condition for the remaining matrix. Right, so as a way of answering that, if we look at what happens when a forest becomes fragmented into lots of little patches, you're creating um, more edge habitat, right, and you have less interior habitat. And that's really the main thing that has the biggest influence on, in terms of um, whether or not you're going to have um, successful populations remaining behind. So believe it or not, even though it looks like this contiguous habit, this contiguous um, clear cutting is going to have a more deleterious impact, the patch cutting results, uh, and again, it depends on which species you're talking about. If we're looking at interior species, that fragmented patch cutting actually has a bigger impact on the species, right? Because you have more edge habitat being created 
and it results in smaller patches, right? So if we go back to the diagram, right? So as these areas are clear cut, the um, remaining, uh, the remaining uh, wildlife populations are kind of being squished into smaller areas in between those patches. And as these patches grow in size, it gets, you get less and less area for those interior species to live in. Whereas with this, even though it's a larger area overall that's being disturbed, you have much more contiguous large patch around it that can absorb the population that's moving through it. Right, and again, that's because you have less of that edge habitat being created. Right, so as you divide a large patch into two smaller ones, it creates additional edge habitat, which leads to higher population sizes and slightly greater number of edge species um, and less of the interior species, right? So here, we, if we just cut this patch in half, then we're creating a lot more edge condition and we're getting rid of a lot of the interior, right? Because you have edge condition, not only where the existing edge was, but also where that new division has been created. And so your proportion of edge to interior is going to increase and that's going to be deleterious to the interior um, wildlife species. And oftentimes that's what we're concerned with because of human development has already created a lot of fragmentation, which means that the edge species are already pretty plentiful. plentiful. We don't need additional habitat for those edge species because they're already plentiful in the landscape. It's those interior species that are being hurt by our development patterns that we would like to try to uh, protect and create more habitat for. Right, and again, so here's just, you know, we're seeing where, you know, you can see the impact on the amount of interior habitat when it gets divided, you're creating more edge habitat and therefore have less area left over for the interior species. Right, and so this is also, of course, going to have um, a relationship to the overall patch size, right? So as a patch becomes smaller, the amount of edge habitat relative to the overall size of the patch is going to increase. So when a patch gets small enough, it essentially becomes all edge habitat and doesn't really have any interior left. And the species that are adapted to that interior are going to either have to move on or become locally extinct within that patch, right? So what we see in these diagrams is that this light green area is the area that's influenced by edge effects. So that's the impact of species that live in the matrix or uh, environmental forces in the matrix like wind and fire and other types of things are going to impact that patch. And the interior is either less impacted or not impacted at all by those edge effects. And the smaller the patch gets, the, the greater the relative proportion of that edge effect and therefore the less habitable it's going to be for the interior species. Right, and again, here's just another diagram basically showing like how those proportion of edge to interior uh, changes as you get smaller, right? So even though this looked like the better option at first, it's actually the more destructive option because it's creating just too much of that edge habitat, right? So if we, here, let's go back to the original diagrams here, right? So, so when we create one big clear cut, it's only creating this much edge habitat when we do little patches of cutting, it's creating a lot more, proportionally speaking, a lot more edge habitat relative to the overall patch size. Right, and so that's why this one actually ends up being the more destructive pattern because we're creating too many edges. And even though it looks like, well, look at all this area we have in between, you know, we actually, it's not all this area. It's like a tiny area in between all these patches. It's actually interior habitat now. 
because we've created so many edges around it. Does that make sense? Okay. Right, and so forest fragmentation is troubling enough when it comes to habitat loss, but it turns out that also has big impacts for climate change. So this is uh, from a study that was done in uh, the journal Nature Communications in 2017. And they found that forest fragmentation, especially in the tropics, um, is, excuse me, is a greater contributor to climate change than was previously thought. So it's been understood for a long time that, removable, that removal of tropical rainforests adds carbon to the atmosphere, but the pattern of the forest loss plays a role too. And that was not previously accounted for. And because forests are being fragmented, that creates an excessive amount of edge conditions as we just saw. So the, a greater proportion of edge as, compo as compared to interior um, patch areas. And plant species that are adapted to the interior find themselves on the edges where they can't survive. And as those plants die off due to the altered environment, they're also releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And so in effect, that's accounting for 30% more carbon release than was previously accounted for as those previously interior species find themselves on the edges, die off and release that carbon into the atmosphere. And so again, it's not just the sheer scale of deforestation that's happening, but it's the fact that it's being fragmented and done in a patchwork as opposed to just clear cutting large areas, which actually would release less carbon into the atmosphere and be better for the interior species than the patterns of development that we're actually seeing. Next, we'll look at patch distribution. So one of the things we want to think about is how patches in the landscape differ from islands in an oceanic archipelago. And so why are we talking about islands in an oceanic archipelago? Does anyone remember the name of the, um, of the sort of branch of study that is related to landscape ecology that comes from the study of- Is it island biogeography? Very good, island biogeography, right? So it's the idea that patches uh, are similar to islands in an oceanic environment and that the movement of species between those patches is going to be similar to some of the types of movement that we see um, amongst islands in an aquatic environment. But they're not exactly the same thing. Right, so um, part of this is going to be uh, dependent upon the distance between those patches, right? So as we saw with the chipmunks, if you have small areas between the patches, species can usually move between those patches. And when we're talking about this in the case of landscape ecology, you're going to have much more movement of species across those gaps than you do with island biogeography, because when you have true islands, then you're limiting the movement of the species to wing species, right? So mostly bird species. Um, when you're looking at the land bound species, they're going to be much more limited in their ability to spread from island to island. Whereas when you have a landscape, a terrestrial landscape with patches, there's a greater ability of those species to move uh, from one large patch to another one. And so that's why these stepping stones become really critical because those stepping stones are creating these intermediary habitat patches that species can move through to get from one large uh, patch to another one. Uh, the problem comes when you have too large a space between those uh, patches, right? So here we have uh, what they're calling a critical gap. And what that means is that the gap has become large enough that the species are no longer willing to move from one small patch to another. And it creates a break in that chain so that you're not going to uh, get that movement of species any longer from one large patch to another one. And that'll uh, weaken the populations of both large patches because you don't have that mixing of the gene pool and you don't have the uh, resilience that comes from uh, 
uh, population being replenished from another nearby large patch, right? And this is just a result of that idea of that effective habitat that we talked about with the chipmunks, where if you do an offset of each of these small patches, um, and they all and all of those offsets touch each other, then you're going to have a larger effective habitat. Whereas when you have too big a gap here, then the species no longer will move across it, and that essentially creates um, a complete break between uh, between these, you know, this large patch and its smaller patch here, and this large patch and its smaller patches. And that brings us to the idea of what's known as meta population dynamics. So a meta population is a population of the same species over a large area of multiple patches um, that all kind of mix with each other, right? So when you re remove a patch, it reduces the size of the meta population, right? So again, that's interacting populations. They're subdivided among different patches. And that increases the probability of local uh, extinctions within those smaller patches and slows down the recolonization process, which reduces the stability of the overall meta population, right? So, so what this is showing is that if you have lots of small patches, um, that the, pot, the meta population of that uh, one species can move more or less easily between those smaller patches. If you remove one of those, then the, I, the likelihood of local extinction increases because it's harder for those species to move. Fewer, them, fewer of them are going to be willing to traverse the greater distance between patches. And therefore you might have like a local extinction event in these two smaller patches that are detached uh, from these three. And, the greater the number of patches are within close proximity to each other, the more stable that meta population will be because you, again, you have more gene transfer and you have um, just more stable populations are mixing with each other. Right, so this is a diagram uh, that's showing meta population structure and the impact that it's going to have on uh, the different ways in which uh, species uh, and particularly meta population of species are going to be able to survive in those different environments, right? So here's the key down here. So the darker green is occupied habitat patches. Uh, the white ovals are vacant habitat patches. Um, obviously, these are boundaries of populations or in these kind of dotted lines. It's a little bit hard to see the difference between them on the screen here. Um, and then you have dispersal with arrows and boundaries of meta populations in the dark green, right? So in this case, and this is basically showing um, the difference between patch size and patch isolation. Right, so if you have lots of small patches are all highly isolated from each other, your meta populations are going to be very small and you have a much higher chance of localized extinction. Um, however, with small patches, as the patch isolation goes down, meaning that the patches are closer together and easier to move between, um, that's going to stabilize the overall meta population. Likewise, if you have um, a larger patch size, um, but you have higher patch isolation, that's going to be better than lots of small isolated patches, um, but not quite as good as having, if you have larger patches that are, um, that are within proximity to each other so that you can have more movement of those species, right? So, um, you know, here you have like a patchy distribution where you have different sizes of patches um, but they're all close enough together for species movement. So you have a more stable meta population, a mainland and island uh, distribution where there's one large patch and surround by lots of smaller patches. This one is lots of smaller patches in uh, close proximity to each other, or you can have lots of small patches that are not in close proximity and that's kind of the worst of all worlds. So we have to think not just about the individual patches, but their relationship to other patches when we're talking about the overall stability of the meta population. And that's the end of class time. So we will stop it there.
and we will pick up with this on Tuesday. So that is it. Um, have a good weekend. And Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Stay dry and warm and have fun shoveling. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Have a good one. Thanks, Scott.